Hello, I'm Dr. Marsha Pierce. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology at Midwestern University in Downers Grove, Illinois. And I'd like to thank you for joining my talk today titled Preclinical Evaluation of Novel Oxytocin Analogs for the Potential Treatment of Social Behavioral Deficits. At the end of this talk today, I hope that you will be able to describe the drug development process and timeline, identify challenges associated with neuropharmacological drug development, differentiate between agonists, partial agonists, and antagonists, discuss how drug effects on cellular signaling and neuronal morphology may relate to the physiological and social behavioral changes at the organismal level. So the drug development timeline and process, how do we get a drug to market? Basic research generally identifies chemicals through synthesis, screening, or examination, and medicinal chemists will identify and modify a number of novel structures that may have activity at our receptor of interest. And then we look at the metabolism and the uh, distribution properties of this in primary cell culture first. If these, any of these 10 to 25,000 initial hits that we have um, have the appropriate properties that we're interested in, then they move on to preclinical testing in animals. In animals, they are generally first screened in one rodent type, such as mouse, and then moved on to one non-rodent uh, animal, such as rabbit. And of these 10 to 20 screenings that would get, chemical screenings that would get moved from the initial synthesis and screening, we want to look for a number of things, including carcinogenicity, genotoxicity, reproductive toxicity, as well as assessing if they are safe and effective in the animal model. If one of these drugs is found to be safe and effective in both a rodent and non-rodent model, then the investigator files an investigational new drug application. At this time, the FDA approves and determines if this can be used in, for clinical trials in humans. Clinical trials in humans are then broken down generally into three phases. The first phase has a very small number of participants, and it's used to test for safety of the drug. Next, they look in a slightly larger group to see if it's efficacious. And finally, in large-scale studies, they look to see if it's worth the potential risks or side effects associated with the drug. If all of these are found to be um, safe, effective, and worth the risk, then a new drug application is um, filed with the FDA and then is analyzed and if approved, they begin uh, registration for their product and post-marketing surveillance, which can last up to 20 years, and looks for uh, additional side effects that may be associated with these drugs. So as you can see from the initial 10 to 25,000 chemical screenings, you see a great attrition occurring over each of these stages to get one single drug to market. Neuroscience drug development is particularly fraught with issues because it's not as simple as, say, looking at a cholesterol drug where you can just look at the cholesterol numbers of LDL and HDL or a blood pressure medication where you're simply screening to address if there's a decrease in blood pressure. They have a very low success rate due to a number of complicating factors, including that nearly all central nervous system therapeutics treat symptoms rather than modifying the disease. Diagnoses of the CNS disorders are often based on clusters of clinical symptoms rather than on objective laboratory measures. Clinical trials often assess subjective measures that are fraught with placebo and nocebo effects, nocebo effects being effects that are expected psychologically to be even though the person is receiving a placebo. And these complexities result in larger, longer, and more expensive clinical trials than for all other medical indications. At a time when neuroscience and clinical drug development is sorely needed due to an aging population and increased burden, healthcare burden, drug companies are largely exiting the neuroscience drug development process. So we need novel ways to assess and identify um, chemicals that may be of interest for them to provide 
better opportunities for neuroscience drug development. So why am I interested in the oxytocin and arginine vasopressin superfamily? This family is highly evolutionarily conserved. In invertebrates, there's a single um, analog associated with a number of these various species, including anapressin in your annelids and nematocin in your nematodes. As we look into gastropods, we see conopressin and in insects, enotocin. However, in about 600 million years ago in fish, there appears to be a gene duplication, which is the first time where we see both an oxytocin analog and a vasopressin analog in your vertebrates. At this time in telos, we see isotocin and vasotocin. When we get to A's, reptilia, and amphibians, we see mesotocin and vasotocin. By the time we get to humans, it's oxytocin and arginine vasopressin, although pigs have lysopressin, and New World monkeys have a great variety of various oxytocin analogs, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And finally, in marsupials, there's another gene duplication where they generally have two oxytocin analogs and three vasopressin analogs. We're particularly interested in the various New World monkey analogs because as you can see with figure A here, leucine oxytocin is the consensus mammalian sequence. And then there is proline oxytocin in blue and it has a proline proline helix at the tail that causes a kink, making this a much more stable analog than the leucine oxytocin that is, is generally found in humans. Additional ones that we see are alanine-8 oxytocin, threonine-8 oxytocin, and phenylalanine-2 oxytocin. Two additional um, analogs that have recently been found are VAL3-PRO8 oxytocin and VAL3-LU8 oxytocin. So if we look at this circle figure on the right-hand side, there are three major clades of New World monkeys. In your Cebidae, which is primarily marked in blue here, all of them express the Pro-8 oxytocin, which has a much longer half-life, except one species of Sanguinus, which has a Val-3 Pro-8 oxytocin that was identified by Vargas Panella. In our Atelidae, there is quite a range, including the Val-3 Lu-8 oxytocin in a howler monkey species, uh, phenylalanine oxytocin, threonine oxytocin, and leucine-8 oxytocin. And then in Cebidae, we can see, again, the alanine-8 oxytocin and other various uh, forms. As we get to our old world monkeys and our hominididae and our uh, protolemurs, we can see that leucine oxytocin is entirely expressed in these other groups. Additionally, evolutionary preservation of function is seen with these oxytocin receptors. So oxytocin receptors are expressed in areas in the brain that are the primary modality of social investigation. And this supports the hypothesis that oxytocin receptors act to regulate social behavior and approach. So if we look at telos, we see the primary expression of oxytocin receptors in the forebrain and midbrain and primitive amygdala regions, whereas if we look in songbirds, we see this expression extended to the vocal and auditory input areas, which is their primary modality of social behavior, whereas in rodents, we also see this expression in the olfactory area, which is their primary modality of social investigation, and as we move to primates, we see that it is expressed in the nucleus basalis of Meinert and in the superior colliculus areas that are very important for visual input and processing. Together, these suggest that the areas that are involved in social behavior and processing of how we interact with others is very important based on where the oxytocin receptor is expressed. So oxytocin and vasopressin receptors are expressed both in the social brain network. And perturbations in oxytocin and or oxytocin receptor result in social behavioral and memory deficits. 
Oxytocin and vasopressin are associated with a number of psychopathologies, including autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and schizophrenia. A number of genetic and epigenetic, as well as social and physiological stimuli affect oxytocin and vasopressin receptor expression. Additionally, we can modify this using psychopharmacotherapy by treating with oxytocin or vasopressin analogs. Unfortunately, because oxytocin and vasopressin do not easily cross the blood-brain barrier, have poor bioavailability, and very short half-lives, currently intranasal oxytocin application is the only option for treatment in humans and higher vertebrates. However, all there are a number of peripheral drugs that are currently in use for the oxytocin and vasopressin system. Now, oxytocin and vasopressin are expressed in the hypothalamic and limbic circuitries, and they act essentially as a yin and yang for behaviors. Oxytocin is associated with anxiolytic behavior, which is a decrease in anxiety, active stress coping, and stress resilience, whereas vasopressin is associated with hyperanxiety or anxiogenic behaviors, anxiety disorders, passive stress coping, depression, and high stress susceptibility. Because these uh, different peptides can act at each other's receptors, how they interact with the receptors has a large effect on whether they are tilting towards the oxytocin or towards the vasopressin um, cell signaling pathways. So the research goal for my work here is to evaluate the structural, which is neurite outgrowth and connectivity, and functional or cellular signaling effects of oxytocin analogs in murine primary neuronal cultures and human-derived neuronal-like cells. The reason that I select a murine primary neuronal culture is because practical and ethical considerations obviously preclude the use of human neuronal, primary neuronal cultures, but animal models do provide an option for studying this as a preclinical test. However, there is only 92% homology between the human oxytocin receptor and the murine oxytocin receptor. So I also want to look at cellular signaling patterns in human-derived SHSY5Y neuronal-like cells to address what cellular signaling differences we may see between the two models. So obviously, because leucine oxytocin on the left here is the endogenous both human and mouse uh, endogenous oxytocin variant, we are also, we're going to use that as our primary um, variant, and then we will look at proline oxytocin, which has the red proline connected right next to the seventh proline that provides that polyproline helix that makes it have a much more stable um, half-life and structural stability. We also are looking at VAL3 Pro8 because it has that same extended half-life and we're comparing it with AVP because arginine vasopressin is also expressed endogenously in both mice and humans. The way that we first analyze the cellular signaling pathways is using high throughput calcium mobilization assays. So we use flow 8 acetylmethyl esterase, a fluorescent dye, that we then incubate our cells for one hour, and then we insert them into what's called a fluorescence imaging plate reader two, and that will read a baseline reading for the first minute of our um, cells, and then it will read a fluorescence increase after it puts the drug in all 98 wells of our plate. And from there, we can then analyze the different um, cell signaling patterns based on dose of specific um, analogs that are put into the uh, flipper. So first, I want to discuss drug potency and efficacy, because these are things that we'll be looking at throughout the rest of the talk. Potency is the concentration at which the drug produces the half maximal effect, or the EC50. So if you look at figure A here, 
on the left, you see that the percent maximal effect is on the y-axis and the log of your drug of interest is on the x-axis. So in this case, drug X is less shifted from drug Y, so it would have a more potent or a higher EC50 than your drug Y. We also look at maximal efficacy, which reflects the capacity of a drug to activate a receptor. And as you can see in figure B here then, we look at the percent of maximal effect over the dose. And as you can see with the red drug X, it is not only more potent for the EC50, but it also has a higher maximal effect, so it's more efficacious than drug Y listed in purple here. So this is some data collected by a colleague who was looking in cells that expressed human vasopressin receptor 1A. And as expected, arginine vasopressin is its endogenous analog, so that would be more potent, but it was also more efficacious than both your leucine or your proline oxytocin, as you can see with the arginine vasopressin in black here and the leucine and proline in red and blue. Something very interesting that they saw in this data, though, was that <clears throat> if they used the leucine and proline in combination with arginine vasopressin, they actually saw that it acted as an antagonist, as you can see in the triangles that are not filled in and the circles that are not filled in here, suggesting that both leucine and proline at the human vasopressin receptor can act to potentially block the anxiogenic effects in addition to what we already see in their anxiolytic effects at the oxytocin receptor. So first, we're going to look at the effects in the human-derived neuronal SHSY5Y cell line, which has, expresses the oxytocin receptor and has the capacity for neurite outgrowth. And so in figure A here, we used the arginine vasopressin, and we saw a very small response in relation to the concentrations of arginine vasopressin, whereas we saw a slightly larger response in B for the leucine oxytocin. So you, as you compare the leucine oxytocin in blue in figure C to the arginine vasopressin, you can see that there was a much larger response, as would be expected if this is at an oxytocin receptor. However, we wanted to confirm that our arginine vasopressin uh, peptide was good, so we chose the human oxytocin receptor CHO cells, which overexpressed the oxytocin receptor to analyze the effects in figure D here with arginine vasopressin and E with leucine oxytocin. And as you can see in figure F, the blue and green, again, you expect to see oxytocin as more potent and similar efficacy in this case um, to the arginine vasopressin, but you would expect it to be much more potent at the oxytocin receptor, which is what we see, suggesting that this is not a problem with our peptide. So next, we wanted to assess if this is occurring at the oxytocin receptor, the vasopressin receptor, or both. So in our SHSY5Y cells, in figure A, here you see the raw data with our leucine 8 oxytocin. And in figure B, it's our leucine 8 oxytocin with pretreated with our vasopressin 1A receptor inhibitor, SR49059 which had no major effect on the response. However, in figure C, we pretreated with our oxytocin receptor inhibitor, L371257, and as you can see, that largely blocked the total response. And in figure D here, that shows that leucine oxytocin and leucine oxytocin with our vasopressin receptor, SR49059, showed very little um, difference in response, whereas with our leucine oxytocin and our oxytocin receptor inhibitor, L371257, it completely abolished the response. These data demonstrate that this is occurring through the oxytocin receptor, which is consistent with microarray data that suggested that SHSY5Y cells express oxytocin receptor, but not vasopressin receptor 1A.
Next, we wanted to look at our three oxytocin peptides to see if they induce calcium mobilization at the oxytocin receptor in SHSY5Y cells. So in figure A here, again, we're looking at the response data for leucine A oxytocin. Figure B here is proline A oxytocin. Figure C is VAL3 pro-8 oxytocin. And figure D here shows the potency and efficacy of these three various oxytocin analogs. And at this point, all three have relative potency and overlapping efficacy, demonstrating no statistically significant uh, difference in either potency or efficacy between the three. Next, we wanted to assess whether this was due to extracellular calcium coming into the cell via calcium channels or intracellular calcium being mobilized via the endoplasmic reticulum. So in figure A here, we show the leucine oxytocin response. In figure B, we have the leucine oxytocin response that was pretreated with one micromolar of sapsagargan, which causes a decrease in the release of your calcium from your endoplasmic reticulum. And as you can see in figure C here, the leucine oxytocin was primarily abolished with the pretreatment of fapsigargan, suggesting that this is intracellular calcium mobilization in our SHSY5 white cells. In figures D, E, and F, we're looking at the same, except with proline oxytocin. At this time in my lab, we are currently assessing VAL3-PRO8. Unfortunately, we did not have the data at the time of this recording. Next, we wanted to look at effects on neurite outgrowth. And figure A here shows an SHSY5Y cell that is grown in control media and pretreated with just our control um, DMSO. And as you see in figure B, then that has been traced using image J with neuron J Fiji package. And in figure C here, you see one, it pretreated for 24 hours with one micromolar of leucine 8 oxytocin. And in figure D, that then is drawn using the image J uh, with neuron J plugin. And so initial data from this is uh, we have analyzed 20 cells so far, or two experiments worth for the leucine oxytocin and 10 cells or one uh, experiment worth with the proline oxytocin for each dose. And as you can see in figure A, with our leucine oxytocin, between negative 6.5 and negative 5.5, which is 300 nanomolar to 3 micromolar, we do see what appears to be a increase in neurite outgrowth. We also see an increase in the number of branches. Now that's branching anywhere on the cell, whereas in figure C, the number of processes is just the number of branches coming directly off the soma. And with a much smaller pool, you're looking at preliminary data here for the proline oxytocin for D, E, and F, which also appear to suggest that we may see these similar outgrowth patterns in the SHSY5Y cells as well. Now, those cells don't have the same dynamic responses that you see in primary dissociated hippocampal cultures. So this is a days in vitro one of our murine primary dissociated hippocampal culture. And these cultures make connections and then have rhythmic calcium oscillations which enable neuroplasticity and enhance connections between the cells. And so first here, we are looking at leucine oxytocin and figure A is our control where you see the rhythmic calcium oscillations and our, just our control box buffer being delivered at one minute. In figure B, you see 10 nanomolar of leucine 8 oxytocin and increasing doses in C, D, and E. And then finally, in F, you see our positive control, veratrodine. And what we can see in figures D and E is that at 1 micromolar and 10 micromolar, there appears to be an increase in the calcium size with early calcium oscillation size of early preliminary data. 
We've also assessed this preliminarily with proline oxytocin and have seen a similar response. We need to replicate this data a couple of more times as well as looking at these same processes using the VAL3 Pro8 in hopes to see how this may affect the calcium oscillations in the primary murine hippocampal. We will then test it with the various inhibitors and further parse out how the cellular signaling pathways are working in these cells. So in summary, this project combines assessing structural or neurite outgrowth and connectivity and functional cellular signaling assays to potentially provide insights into mechanisms that modulate social behavior. Knowledge of how oxytocin alters neuronal structure and function has the potential to both identify mechanisms that produce social dysfunction and inform the development of oxytocin-mediated therapeutic agents. And as you can see, these are very preliminary studies that I'm currently working on in my lab, but we do have future directions to complete the ongoing analyses with these oxytocin analogs in both our SHSY, 5Y, and our primary marine cultures. Additionally, we'd like to examine the structural and functional characteristics of additional oxytocin analogs. And finally, we would like to cross the oxytocin receptor expressing GSP mouse line with a mouse model of autism spectrum disorder to examine oxytocin analog therapeutic effects on social behaviors, cellular signaling, and neurite structure in a single model. At this time, I would like to thank all of the people that have helped contribute to this work, including my laboratory students, uh, Nishi Vadim, Bisney Paniker, Supriya Bhuvanagiri, Ashley Gore, Arij Aziz, and Marissa Gare. I'd also like to thank the Department of Pharmacology at Midwestern University, Midwestern University College of Graduate Studies Intramural Research Funding, who has funded this study, and I'd like to thank LabRoots for giving me the opportunity to pre present my data. Thank you.